Hello everybody, it's Mr. Second Amendment, and as promised, this is the IFAC video. This originated from the Gearology Battle Belt video, and uh, this is part of the Gearology series. I'm going to go ahead and flash it up and put that in the comments right now. Basically, I said in that video, I think the IFAC deserves its own video, and it does, and here it is. IFAC stands for Individual First Aid Kit, and I really want to stress the I in that, the individual in that acronym, because when we're talking about an IFAC, I'm going to go ahead and open it right now. Okay, we're talking about an IFAC. This is dealing with the individual care. Okay, what we need to understand, the backstory behind this, there is basically a three-tier system when it comes to medical care. I'm not talking about paper cuts or anything minor. I'm talking about uh, tra serious traumatic injury. We've got severe blood loss. We've got a compound fracture. We've got a gunshot wound. We've got a ch sucking chest wound. We've got something pretty nasty. Maybe uh, we got an extremity that got blown off. We need to uh, mitigate the bleeding and kind of continue on from there. Something pretty traumatic, pretty serious. Uh, mostly, of course, this is more of a battlefield or military-oriented pack. But I think hunters, law enforcement, hikers, camping people, everybody like that, I think you guys are going to get use out of this, and it's definitely worth showing. So, uh, moving on from that point, the three-level tier, you got level one, two, and three. Basic essential background story of that is each level, you are basically passing the torch or passing the baton to sustain that person or that individual onto the next level of support. Okay, we got the golden hour. We want to get somebody in by the golden hour. Okay, so instant, level zero, all of a sudden point of impact, something happens. All right, level one is IFAC. Maybe Doc rushes over with level two, which is going to be CLS, combat lifesaver. He's going to have a CLS bag and his uh, qualifications and his skill. He's going to have a little bit more, than, and we're going to talk about that, of his capabilities versus this real quick. And then he's basically going to get you to the point where sustained, uh, hopefully someone's calling in a nine line or getting you, uh, you know, ambulatory, something like that, getting helo called in. And uh, they're going to bring you to level three, which is a hospital. Okay, level one is IFAC. And like I said, i got to stress the I in that individual. This is what you are going to carry to immediately save your own life. This is your first layer of medical protection when something very serious happens. Okay, so you are either going to open this or you are going to have a buddy run up to you if you're lucky enough. And he's going to open this and start helping you or doing it for you if you're not in the position to be able to do that. And uh, he's basically going to find what's in here and start using it. Okay, we got to remember the I and IFAC because when that one guy goes down, we have to use his own stuff initially to get the ball rolling of care. Okay, maybe Doc's going to come over, Corman's going to come over, and he's got a CLS. He's going to start working stuff. Now, the CLS, we're going to have things like we're going to be able to start IVs. We got fluids. Uh, we're going to have suture gear. Uh, we're going to have meds. Uh, we're going to have a lot more capability when it comes to the CLS over the IFAC. So that's where we jump from level one to level two. Now, when they get you, they call in the nine line, they get the helicopter out of there, or you get out of there, okay, that guy still has to continue mission, right? He's still got a patrol. They still maybe got a couple days outside the wire. Whatever's going on, they got to continue the mission. So that's why he's not using his stuff. He's using your stuff. Okay, so an IFAC can't really, uh, Esther, uh, can't really say that enough. This is I for individual because it's for you. That being said, I like to keep it somewhere obvious, somewhere open to where I could easily get to it. Somebody can easily get to it. It's not tucked away in some deep, dark pocket somewhere. It's somewhere very obvious and easy to get to. Okay, moving on from that, I think you guys understand the level one, two, and three. One is IFAC, two is CLS, three is hospital. Okay, so we're going to move on from there. I'm just going to get into what you see here. Okay, we're just going to go... Basically, I'm going to try to go in a natural progression of how the injury is going to go, or I'm just going to go in this. We'll just talk it through. First and foremost, I have a TK4 tourniquet. The thing about the TK4 is you're going to have uh, TK4 haters out there. You're going to have the, the cat fanboys. I like all tourniquets because they all do essentially the same function, which is, holy crap, someone's leg or arm just blew off. I got to cut off the circulation right now. I got to stem that flow. This is a little bit bungee, but at some point it stops and you, it's very, very basic, very simple. There's really no special knobs and Velcro or anything like a cat. This is just very extremely simple. Um, and that's the thing about a tourniquet is I think you never really can have enough and especially statistically looking at the war that we're engaged in right now Number one cause of death on the battlefield is blood loss from extremity loss. We're talking IEDs something happens It's stream quick rapid blood loss and we have no way of stopping it Okay, the tourniquet is there to combat that and try to save lives and the TK4 tool has definitely saved a lot of lives doing that 
cat tool. I think multiple tourniquets is a good idea. I think having something wrappable like a TK4 and then having a cat on the outside is also a good idea. Um, I may actually do that in the future, but I can also use a belt as a tourniquet. Take off a rigger's belt is my favorite. Use that as a tourniquet. Also, that kind of rolls into the next piece of gear. And this is the Israeli bandage. Okay, this is known as the emergency bandage. I'm gonna flash up some high-speed pictures. I don't wanna take it out because it has to stay sterile, of course. But the emergency bandage, AKA the Israeli bandage, it was designed by an IDF medic. It came, hit the scene in 2000. It's been kind of the NATO standard. Everyone's been using it since then, US military, whatnot. And it's a very cool, ingenious bandage, if you actually ask me, okay? It's got the, basically the tension applicator. It's a shape that looks like that. I'll show you in the pictures. And basically what happens is you, and the cool thing is you don't, you don't have to risk touching, you know, the sterilized portion of the inner part of the uh, bandage. You just take it with the hands and you apply it on and then you go ahead and just wrap. And the cool thing is you can wrap through the tension applicator and then counter wrap and basically what you've just done is you can create up to 30 pounds of pressure constantly pressing on that wound without even without having to sit there and put pressure on it it'll do it for you okay even the cooler thing about it because the emphasis i just placed on tourniquets is the fact that if you know what you're doing with the closure bar okay the bar that closes it off you can actually take that and start twisting it and make it into a tourniquet Okay, so maybe it's not the world's greatest purpose-built tourniquet, obviously, but in a pinch or if you need it now, you can turn it from a bandage and all of a sudden, guess what? I need a tourniquet. It is a tourniquet. Okay, so the Israeli bandage, a huge life-saving piece of gear. That has saved so many lives and that is a very valuable piece of gear. I think it's essential in an IFAC that's kind of designed where we're headed, which is, you know, severe trauma. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. Okay, right here, just have a very simple basic packs of uh, alcohol wipes here basically to prep this is to get the sweat the dirt the dust the mud um, to get everything off so i can go ahead and apply some medical tape or some mile per hour tape um, very simple just for that purpose next we're going to have the h and h okay i don't think you can have too many h and h bandages i'm gonna go ahead and pull one out and uh, i'm not going to open it obviously but let it get in focus here this is your h and h uh, basically it's four and a half by four yards six ply cotton vacuum seal compressed so you can throw it in an ifac that's one of the downsides of an ifac it's just kind of the nature of the beast is there is a little bit of a space not a little bit there's a lot of a space limitation factor going on here which is why the cls level two is is going to sustain you for some type of squad event um, but this again the i and ifac don't forget about it this is just for you going back to the h and h's what do they do you can use them for different purposes really though h and h you can just pack into an open wound Okay, now we may need to stop the bleeding. We need the, we, we uh, may need to use what's called a hemostatic agent. So we're talking quick clot or something like that. And I'll get to that in a second. But if we need to pack a wound, we're gonna be doing it primarily with H&H. &H. Okay, last thing on the top flap is gonna be the medical roll of tape. And this is something I would kind of jerry rig. And basically I pull it out. So I grab it and I just pull it out and I take my tape and I can just start pulling off what I need. Um, maybe if I need to hand this tape to a buddy, I'll just go ahead and take the carabiner and I'll throw that to my buddy or take this on the move if I need to get it out of the IFAC. Um, but basically, this is a very cheap, quick, easy, simple solution to make something that's kind of cool. Um, I actually kind of surprised myself at how ingenious that was. So you just pull back and just zip it. You'll see a lot of times they'll do this with 550 cord on some IFACs, which is also cool. Um, I just like this because I have a carabiner if I need it. Um, if I don't want to use the carabiner for this purpose, then I can take it out and use it for something else. I can quickly just dig this out and grab it. I can quickly clip it in and out. So there's there's a lot of cool things I can do with that. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Just a random idea for you. Okay, moving into, I'm going to see if I can shift this up. And I put it on my backpack today because I was doing a uh, class on the range. Didn't need the battle belt for it. So I had to modify it, take it off. All right, so moving on. I'm just gonna bring out everything that is hidden in this pouch and we'll go over that first. Okay, kind of in line with the H&H, &H, these are ABD pads and uh, basically the whole idea here is I would really only use these if the situation is not that bad or the situation is really bad. All right, so if the situation's somewhat okay and it's not too bad, it doesn't really warrant the whole use of a four yard you know, H&H &H gauze, I'm gonna go ahead and break out the ABD pad. Reason for that is it's very small, very simple. Five to nine is pretty much like a photograph size. You're gonna take it, cover it up, pack it, whatnot. 
really not that hard, really not that difficult, I'd, or the situation's so bad to where I need extra packing material. Moving on from that, we're gonna go into the quick clot. I kind of talked on that just now, and here's the details on it. This happens to be the powder form. They've recently started making the gauze form, which is also pretty cool. But the whole idea here is we have severe bleeding, okay? Maybe it's a situation that we cannot use a tourniquet for. So it's a gut, a belly wound, chest wound, something like that. Obviously you can't use a tourniquet there. So what do we do? We take this, rip that open, and we just dump. It's about three and a half ounces uh, from what I remember. I have to read that label there. But you take that thing and then just boom, dump it in. And immediately, this stuff is wicked sick how quick it just st starts to stop the bleeding. This is for huge arterial bleeds, huge issues. You're gonna take that, dump it in, you take your H&H, &H, put it on top, top it off with your Israeli bandage, um, ABD pads on top if you need it, underneath the Israeli bandage, whatever you need. Um, downside of the powder though, you have to be careful of where and how much you use this on the body, and my medics are gonna know what I'm talking about there. Next thing is if a helo's coming in, there's wind, whatever's going on, okay, if I rip this and I try to dump it and all of a sudden the wind picks up, that could be an issue, and I understand why they did the quick clock gauze and I think it is a worthy investment either way so we'll go ahead and tuck that back in okay next hyphen chest seals I got two of them something we've not talked about yet is the fact that if you have a, a issue or some type of injury that is penetrating the chest wall okay I'm gonna rotate this back so we have something that is basically penetrating the chest wall we have air that's coming in Okay, our body is naturally, unfortunately, going to make a one-way valve. So air is going to be coming in, but it's not going to be leaving. Okay, that's going to that's going to be called a tension pneumothorax. And what's going to happen there is there's too much pressure going on. Okay, and it's pushing on the lungs. The guy can't breathe. It could be a very quickly become a very uh, life-threatening situation. So what are we going to do? We're going to counteract the body's one-way valve, and we're going to create our own hyphen chest seal or any other chest seal. It's going to have is basically going to seal it off in three directions. So basically this is a really bad analogy, but this is essentially what's happening. If you have an open mouth and you put your grocery bag over that and you breathe in, you're not going to get any air in. You breathe out and it will let the air out. That's essentially kind of in layman's terms, that's what a chest seal is doing. Okay, it doesn't even really have to be a perfect seal because the whole point is you're putting the plastic over the wound so it can't suck air in, but you leave one slit perfectly unsealed so it can vent air out when you exhale. Okay, so chest seals got two of them in case the round goes clean through and it penetrates the chest wall on two sides. Could be a very serious issue, don't want that to happen. Um, but I got them just in case. I also have a Halo chest seal in my CLS and uh, kind of left that in there. Also good honorable mention there. Next thing, got the MRE beverage bag. It's kind of under here for kind of a gruesome reason. Okay, if I had to though, I could take this and I could turn this into kind of a ghetto chest seal. Uh, they actually taught us how to do that. You just open this up and I could use, one thing I failed to show you is my little tiny roll. It's about four feet of uh, mile per hour tape, pretty much duct tape. And I could take this beverage bag as is, lay it on and then seal up with this tape three sides and I can turn that into a ghetto hasty chest seal. Um, also the grim reason why I kind of have it is if you needed to, to stuff organs in here, okay, if an organ comes out of the body, the number one thing that is going to kill it, the number one problem is when it dries out. Okay, we want to keep it moist, warm, and wet. So if you pack in the bag with some, you know, moisture and you're able to keep it and preserve it, um, then you're not going to have as many issues as, as, you know, if you had just left it out. So hopefully we can just pack that away and never have to worry about that. But it's there. There is there is value in having a bag that can hold and contain things. Next, we got the black nitrile gloves. Uh, essentially, this is no latex or synthetic or man-made or natural rubber. None of that powder. Some of the stuff that people ha are somewhat allergic to. So the gloves. Uh, my regret here is I only have one pair. I think you should have at least two to three. You can never really kind of like the H and H. You can never really have too many of those. Obviously, when you're working with you know, blood or bodily fluids or anything like that. You definitely want to make sure you're, you glove up, um, especially some of this stuff is invasive. We're going to get to that um, in the next couple of pieces of gear. But uh, you definitely, possible squirting stuff going on, having to handle stuff with blood, bloody fluids. You don't want to mess with that without gloves on. 
Should be pretty self-explanatory. Next, got a Sharpie. It's always good to be able to transmit, transmit information. Essentially, when you get that person, if you're successful, you get that person to level three, and let's say nobody is there or present or able to speak for the patient and, and tell the doctors what happened, you wanna be able to write a little note or write down what happened. They told us to put a T, a letter T on the guy's forehead if you're doing a tourniquet somewhere very obvious and blatant so they know that you did a tourniquet or when he comes in he's got a bunch of clothing on a bunch of gear he's got maybe a jacket or a poncho maybe it's cold he's got a bunch of layers on okay that's going to immediately let the hospital staff know hey this guy has a tourniquet somewhere on his body and then by the way this is the time that we put the tourniquet on little side subject there um, contrary to the popular belief you can preserve limbs that you apply a tourniquet to there is a little bit of time factor there obviously but if you get it within enough time there's been plenty of research and documented cases to show that yes after you apply a tourniquet of the situation if you get there soon enough and they can handle it appropriately yes you can still save the limb okay just like the brain can go five minutes without oxygen your limbs can go i think it was about two hours without circulation before it's just totally over so the time you place the tourniquet is going to be critical. All right, moving on to this our decompression needle. Okay, this happens to be 14 gauge. 10 gauge is also a little bit better because you know if it's going to be bigger, why not? Especially when this gets gummed up with uh, blood clots or dried blood or nastiness. The whole idea, going back to the chest seal situation, if you either failed to put on a chest seal or you didn't catch it or it was rapidly happening way too quick, whatever the reason, there's too much oxygen, too much air building up inside the chest wall and it's creating that tension pneumothorax. And essentially what's happening is the guy can't breathe, it's hurting, there's causing issues, possible lung deflation, collapsing, whatever. Okay, you immediately have to relieve the pressure. You gotta do that with the needle. The needle is shrouded in a catheter. You pop it in the right place until it starts hissing. You pull out the needle and you let the catheter just sit there to vent the chest wall and the chest cavity. Okay, so that's, you know, hopefully it wouldn't have to come to that, but it's always good to have that. Next, uh, they call this the nasal trumpet. Um, essentially, is the uh, nasal pharyngeal airway. And, and what it's going to do is essentially if the person's unconscious, um, if they're having some type of fit or seizure or their jaw is locked up or their tongue is getting in the way, whatever, and they're having issues breathing for those reasons, all right, you can create and maintain an artificial airway with this. And, uh, of course, you got the Dynalube uh, to lubricate it so it goes in uh, quicker and easier. So essentially, I think I pretty much hit the end of the kit here, um, except for the outside, I'll show you that. Okay, so we got all that in there. On the outside, I wrote the blood type, my blood type, again, going back to the eye and eye fact, you don't want to underestimate that. Um, I don't think, there, for many cases, there really may not be a need for this, but you know what, if it's so quick, easy, and painless to do, why not just write it on there to let the world know, you know, if somebody is treating you and you're not conscious or capable of telling them, um, basically blood type is right there. Boom. Next, I got the shears. Um, there's all kinds of different gear that you can get in terms of the shears. Uh, we're talking the Benchmade uh, triage and a bunch of other emergency things. They make shears and you can get the attachment that basically cuts through uh, seatbelt material, jeans, pants, anything like that to get to what you need to. Shears are the one thing that you can, or one of the several things like uh, shears and tourniquets, because they're not needed to be sterile and because they take up space, it's something that you want to keep outside the pouch. In this case, I keep it within the molly webbing, um, wherever it's convenient. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom out because we're pretty much there. But um, this is just a very basic IFAC. And again, that's what level one is supposed to be. Okay, level one is basic. Um, it's you treating yourself or somebody taking this kit and treating you with whatever's in here until level two can arrive. And once level two is there, their mission is to get you to level three. And of course, once you're at the level three, their mission is to sustain you and get you into recovery. So um, it's kind of that level of care. There is time involved. And if you stock this properly, you know what you have and you know how to use it this is one of the most effective ways to save your life. And one last part is I usually, I tuck in this drawstring right there on that zipper and I'll go ahead and zip this up. Okay, I only have one, one of the zipper strings exposed and usually on my gear, I don't like any straps or strings or anything hanging or dangling around. This is the one thing I don't mind that's out because if I need it, I just unzip, gravity makes it fall, and then all of a sudden I have everything I need. Or I can quickly, usually it's on the battle belt, I can take off the battle belt, they can work on it, or I can just be laying on my back and it's exposed like that. 
whatever the case. Um, so anyway, hopefully this has kind of shed some light on the mystery of the IFAC, I guess you can say. Um, you know, there's always room for improvement and medics out there, docs, corpsmen, um, appreciate your service and what you do for us. And uh, please comment for any suggestions, questions, anything like that. So thanks for watching.